Hey everybody, Cajun Techie here, and today I'm going to show you how to generate a new PGP key using the open source version of PGP called GPG, or the New Privacy Guard. Now, the new Privacy Guard is, as I said, an open source version of the popular PGP email and file encryption program. It is completely free and unencumbered by any patents or, um, or, or NDAs or anything like that and can be gotten from most systems. It's available for all variants of Linux, Mac, and of course Windows. And so um, we're going we're gonna to go through generating a new PGP key using GPG um, and this is compatible with the way you do it with PGP itself. So if you're a PGP user, um, these uh, instructions will actually carry over into your PGP installation as well. I should also say that we're going to be using Fedora 18 Linux to uh, to do this tutorial. However, because GPG is kind of a cross-platform uh, piece of software, this will work on Windows, it'll work on Mac, it'll work on any variant of Linux, and so uh, whatever operating system you're using, you should be able to follow these instructions and uh, and get it running. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start the terminal. Now in Windows the terminal is called the command line and it's available um, under accessories. In Mac it's called the terminal and I'm not really sure where it's available because I'm not a Mac user and of course in Linux it's simply called the terminal um, and you can open it and this is what you see. So the very first thing that we're going to do is we're going to tell GPG that we want to start the key generation process and we're going to do that by typing GPG which is the name of the program tac tac gen dash key and so we're using the long option here and so we're going to do two uh, dashes before the command and we're going to separate each word in the command by one dash and we're going to hit enter the very first thing GPG wants to know is the type of key that we're going to generate. Now, there are several different types of keys we can generate depending on what our preferences are and what our security needs are. I personally trust the uh, GPG designers to choose a good strong key type and they recommend RSA and RSA which is good enough for me um, and that means that RSA is used for encrypting your email and RSA is also using for signing your emails and files. So um, I'm going to go ahead and go with one and now it's going to ask us to create or to select a key size. Now, your key size is the amount of bits that go into your key. The default, you can create a key from 1024 bits all the way up to 4096 bits. Um, the default is 2048, which is enough for most people. I'm a little paranoid, so I like to do 4096, but we're going to go with 2048 here since that's the recommended key length. Um, I would tell you do not do anything below 2048. It is not recommended, and it's widely believed that with computer technology uh, progressing as it is, 1024-bit uh, keys will fall sometimes within the fairly near future. Uh, that may be 5, 10 years from now, but it still will fall. So we're going to go ahead and go with 2048 um, to generate this key. And the next thing we need to do is select when our key uh, will expire. Now we can make our key expire in a number of days, a number of weeks, a number of months, a number of years, or our key can live in perpetuity. The reason you want to expire keys is because the way, again, the way the computer technology is progressing, a strong key today may not be a strong key in three or five years, and you may want to retire that key and generate a new key uh, that's stronger for your use. And so this allows you basically to kind of guesstimate. It's like, okay, within the next three years, I think that my key might be in danger of falling, so I'm going to have it. Uh, I'm going to have it retire um, in three years. I usually do three to five years. Live, letting it live in perpetuity isn't really that big of a deal, um, but it does give you a little bit of a headache to retire keys. So I would always put a um, put a limit on how long your key lives, and you can extend that limit later on. So I'm going to go ahead and make this key live for three years, which is going to be three Y, and it's going to tell me that this is when that key will expire. It's going to expire on Friday, the third of June. 2016 at 3.13 p.m. and it asks me if that's okay. I say yes. Now it's going to ask for some personal information. We have to put in our name and this name can be totally fake, whatever you happen to use. We have to put in the email address associated with the key. Again, this can be fake as long as you get email somewhere and you have possession of the private key, you can um, decrypt the email. However, I usually recommend that you actually do use your real email address. In this case, I'm going to use my uh, Hushmail address, and I do not recommend that you use Hushmail unless you use PGP. Don't rely on Hushmail's built-in encryption. It's crap, and they will hand over your unencrypted data to um, or, or a, any requesting authorities 
um, if they if they ask for it. So if you're going to use Hushmail, definitely generate a PGP key. Don't rely on Hushmail's built-in encryption. So I'm going to use my Hushmail account here, and I'm going to type in at hushmail.com, and we can put in a comment, and that comment can be something cutesy or uh, that can remind us of what key this is or anything like that. I choose not to make a comment because I don't really need it. And then it's going to say, is this okay? It's going to give us our information about our key. It's going to give us our name and email address. And we say, okay, it is okay. We can do it. Now it's going to ask for a passphrase. A word about the passphrase. Your passphrase is the only thing stopping an attacker from being able to decrypt your email if they get a hold of your private key. If you have a strong passphrase, you can hand out your private key to the world and there's nothing they can do about it or nothing they can do with it. If you have a weak passphrase, if your key falls into the wrong hands, they can break it and they can decrypt email uh, that's sent to you and they can also send email as you and sign email as you. So the rule of thumb is create a long, complicated um, passphrase as long as you can and use maybe a passphrase manager to be able to uh, remember what that passphrase is. Don't, don't make it so even you can remember it. Make it really long. I like to make mine 32 or 50 random uh, characters. In this case, because we're just doing this as a test, I'm going to do uh, 1, 2, 3, 4 as my passphrase, which is really insecure. And I'm going to repeat it, 1, 2, 3, 4. And now it's going to try to gain entropy. Entropy is the amount of randomness that goes into your key. And you can help your operating system um, gain entropy by opening programs, using the disk, typing on the keyboard, uh, doing anything that, that basically makes the computer compute and do things. So in this case, we're going to, uh, I'm going to pause here and I'm going to skip until the entropy collection is complete. Um, and then I'll come back with the video because this can take a while and there's no point in you having to, to watch, uh, watch it do this. So we're going to pause and then we'll come right back. All right, we're back, and as you can see, the key has been successfully generated. It took a little while to generate the entropy that we needed, but uh, once we got that done, everything's good to go. Here you can see this is the key ID, and the key has been marked as ultimately trusted, and trust is basically a concept in PGP that goes with how much, how sure you are that the key is owned by who it says it's owned by. And of course, in our case, uh, since we generated the key, we know it's owned by us, and so we can trust it ultimately. Uh, we can also see that the public and private key uh, were created and signed because, of course, we sign our own key always in addition to whoever else signs the key. And uh, key signature will be, our signing keys will be discussed in another video uh, whenever we go into the more uh, esoteric details and the more user-oriented uh, details of PGP. Uh, but for now, just know that your key is always signed whenever you create it. Um, you can see here some just information about it. Um, I'm not going to go into really what that information is since it's pretty much above this video's, uh, this video's goal. Uh, but you can see we created a 24-8-bit 24 signing key and of course a 24-8-bit uh, encryption key for Cypherpunk at Hushmail. Um, and that's all the information. Now, let's go ahead and just check to make sure that that key was generated. Even though we're, we're being told all of this stuff, let's go ahead and use the list keys function to actually list the key and make sure that it was generated. We do that by typing gpg, tac tac, list keys, and then the email address that we wanted verified that the key was created for. So, in our case, we're going to do hushmail, uh, cypherpunk at hushmail.com. And as you can see, it tells us a little bit about our key. And there it is there. Um, we can see that there is a uh, encryption subkey, signing key, our name, the trust, and the email address, as well as the expiration date for each of the keys. And so we know now that the key has been properly generated. And that's, that's all there is to it. That's all there is to actually creating a new PGP key. Now you're ready to begin exchanging encrypted emails uh, and, and encrypting your files, which we're going to go into uh, both of those in subsequent videos over the next couple of days. Right now, just uh, sit back and enjoy the fact that you now have your very own PGP key. Congratulations.